Thank you very much. Um, you see the title of the talk, it's, uh, it's about strong terahertz fields and something on the small scale. Um, so before I forget it in the end, when, I, when I'm in a rush to get done, then let me just say right away that this is a collaborative work between a lot of people, as always. And you can see here that it's a combination of other PIs from DTU and a long list of PhDs and postdocs who some are still here and some are not with, with us anymore. Well, they are here, but not in my group anymore or, or in our groups. Uh, and some external collaborators also. And this is a picture from the lab. You can see that the people are there twice, but the important thing is just to show you that we are doing experimental optics. So we work with uh, femtosecond amplified laser systems. We don't build the lasers ourselves in contrast to a class group. Uh, but we use them. So it's commercial, millijoule class, uh, titanium sapphire based lasers, all of it. Um, ultra fast terahertz science and technology is a huge field. This is a little bit like saying mid infrared. It's not a topic, it's a frequency range, right? And the terahertz field is also a frequency range. So there's a lot of things going on in the terahertz field. I've listed a bunch of things that I don't, don't want to read all of them up, and there might be things that I have missed here. Uh, but just to say that there's a lot of different physics going on in the terrace range, and I'm not going to cover all of it, even though the title sounds like it's just all related to terahertz stuff. But it's not, of course. So what I'm after today is basically I will give you a few slides about how do we do terahertz spectroscopy things, how do we work with this. And then I will show you some examples of how we operate with what I call here far fields. So regular spectroscopy in the far field where we have free space optics and focus with mirrors and stuff. And some words on what can we see if we go to the near field. So focus beyond the standard diffraction limits. And then towards the end, I will show you some examples of what we can use terahertz fields for if they're really strong. Um, so how do we do it? It's free space optics, like I told you. Um, and here you see a prototypical experiment where we have our femtosecond amplifier here. Generates, let's say, 5 millijoules. 35 femtosecond pulses is our standard. Uh, the repetition rate is 1 kilohertz. So it's low rep rate compared to some of class lasers. Uh, and that we can, we can change the wavelength with an OPA system like this. But in general, we have basically a pump and probe set up here where we, if we take this part here first, one part of the beam generates terahertz radiation by some means. The example I've shown here is a plasma, so a femtosecond plasma. We, the intensity of the pulses is so high that we can ionize air. We generate a free electron plasma, or yeah, basically a plasma of, let's say, nitrogen uh, ions and free electrons, right? Uh, and there are some processes there. If we do it right, then we generate strong and broadband terahertz radiation. And that propagates through a standard optical system with a re with the reflective optics. We can either do transmission measurements of a sample or reflection measurements, depending on how we set it up. Uh, so just to indicate that. And then we have a detection scheme over here where we can detect the temporal shape, the E of T, the electric field as a function of time of that field. Cool. Uh, to be a little bit more specific, then uh, what I'm showing you here is actually a system that, that can do pump and probe experiments. So that the terahertz pulses are super short or sub-picosecond long pulses that transmit through the sample and that lends itself to time resolved studies that we can pump the sample with an optical pump and then probe a certain amount of femtoseconds or picoseconds later what happened, right? And that is what this scheme here illustrates because there's another part of the beam here that you can see we can pump the sample at a specific time determined by the delay up here and um, then transmit the terahertz pulse through or reflect the terahertz pulse from the sample at a specific pump and probe time afterwards. And what I indicate here is just a little bit about how it works. We have a chopper here that chops the pump beam so that we can modulate pump on, pump off, right? So we can see, see how much the signal changes. And the detection mechanism over here is something I will show you in the slide what that means, but basically where we can switch the or, or we can modulate the detection efficiency with a certain frequency also. And in this case, this is 500 hertz. So we have a 1,000 hertz laser. We modulate the detection of the terahertz waveform at half that frequency. And then we modulate if we pump the sample at half that frequency again. 
And that means if we use two logins and look at those, the, those chopping frequencies here, then we can detect the signal itself and the modulation of the signal. And in differential language, that would be delta E over E, right? So that, that's how we can do this uh, pump and probe stuff in a quite nice way. Um, the technique we use for generation and, and detection of terahertz waves is what we call terahertz air for, for photonics. This is not invented by us, but we use it quite a lot. Uh, and the way we generate terahertz radiation is that we form a, a plasma channel in air or nitrogen gas or some other gas with a two-color femtosecond laser field. Uh, it's a long story how this works, but the basic principle is that the two-color laser field here generates an asymmetric electric field as function of time, and that asymmetric field leads to an asymmetric acceleration of the electrons in the plasma, and that leads to radiation of a broadband terrace pulse. End of that story. Uh, it works very nicely, and the detection is what we call terahertz field-induced second harmonic generation, or TFISH, um, where I'll show you some equations in just a moment, but the radiation coming out of such a plasma here looks like what you see here. This is basically, this is an experimental recording where we took a terahertz camera and moved across the focal region of such a terahertz beam. So you can see that outside of the focal region we have this like donut-like, ring-like structure and then the beam collapses to more or less a Gaussian beam in the focus here and then it expands again into this ring here. Um, and just to, there will not be so many equations in this uh, talk here, but, but just a few. The, the way the detection here works is basically that we focus a red probe beam at frequency omega uh, in the same region where we focus the terahertz wave. And that means we have a strong terahertz field, we have a strong optical field. We are in, in, uh, in basically uh, in a gas, and that means we don't have a chi 2, for instance. The, there's, a, there's a center of inversion, so the first nonlinearity we see will be the third order, so the chi 3, right? So, what can happen there is four wave mixing, we can mix two photons at the probe frequency, omega and omega, and then a terahertz photon at capital omega, and then we generate omega plus omega plus minus this terahertz frequency here. And that is basically in, in practice. Since the terahertz frequencies are low and the probe frequencies are high, this is basically a light generated at two small omega. So red light turns into blue light. Right? That's cool. Uh, since it scales in this manner here, it means that the electric field generated at two omega is proportional to the chi 3 of the medium, of course, but then the terahertz field strength and the intensity of the probe field. But we never detect the electric field of blue light. We detect the power, right, or the intensity. And that means the intensity in this way here is proportional to the terahertz field squared, which is the intensity of the terahertz field. We don't like that. We would like to get the field itself. And it's not enough just to take the square root of this signal because we don't get the sign, right? All right, cool. So we want the field. And the way we, <coughs> we get that is to, you can see that we have added like a bias voltage up here. And that is basically we break the symmetry of the air by applying a DC bias so that it matters whether the terahertz field is against that DC bias or with it, um, basically. And that means the local, or sorry, the low frequency terahertz field that we have as a square up here is still a square, but now we have the terahertz field plus that DC bias field. And then if you work that out, it turns out like this here. Uh, so that's just solving this complicated square here, right? Um, and then you can see that, that, that there's a term here, the cross term between the bias and, oh, I call it EDC here, it should have been bias. I wrote it last night, so I didn't proofread it yet. So basically, plus or minus here depends on whether the bias points upwards or downwards, right? So, 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 so that's why on, on the previous slide, we modulate the bias up and down, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And then we set our login amplifier to look at that modulation frequency and boom, then we get this term out, which is proportional to the terahertz field strength. So that's how we get the coherence uh, out of this detection. All right, normally I don't spend so much time on this, but I wanted to show you how it, how, how it works actually, because it's not super straight f forward. So these are now oscilloscope traces. If we just look at the output, the blue light output coming out of such an experiment here. We have time on the x-axis, of course, and then on the y-axis we have the intensity of the blue light that is generated. 
And if we have no modulation in any way, there's no DC bias, there's no pump modulation of the terrace pulse, then we just see you know, a blip of blue light. And this is the T-fish signal. And then you can see if we switch on the DC, let's do that down here, we switch on the DC bias modulation so that the DC goes plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, and this is a couple of kilovolts per centimeter. So then you can see that the signal is, is sometimes bigger and sometimes smaller than it is up here. And that's because we are either you know, parallel or anti-parallel with the terahertz field. So it works, L like we can see the modulation is something, it's not you know, 10 to minus five signal or something like that, it's pretty big. And then if we switch off the DC bias, but now excite the sample so that the reflectivity, this is, this is recorded where the terrace pulse is reflected off a piece of gallium arsenide as the sample. So if we photo excite the gallium arsenide, we lift carriers to the conduction band, the, the reflectivity changes, the reflectivity becomes more like a metal, right? So the reflectivity gets bigger. So if you do that, then you can see that, okay, with no pump, the signal is here, with pump, it's up here. So there's a big modulation here. And if we do the whole thing at once, both DC bias modulation and pump modulation, pump on and off, then we get overall a signal like this here. So we have four different signal levels. And this is what we need to record in order to find out what is the reference terror signal and what is the modulation delta E. So delta E over E is what is needed. If we do pump and probe stuff, we stick this into a box car so that we can sort it out and so on. I don't want to spend too much time on that. But basically, then, then we can basically, with some login scheme or AD cards or something, we can pick out these different signals, signal levels and do the math and figure out what are the terror signals as a function of time. All right. So one example of that that leads to the first point I want to make is we can use this for spectroscopy. And what you see here is a terahertz spectroscopy measurement with such pulses. You can, here you can see what the pulses look like. This is time in, in picoseconds, so it's very short pulses. And this is some s signal. This is that demodulated signal. So this is something proportional to the electric field uh, that you see up here. And the experiment is that the blue curve is just transmission through a silicon substrate. So uh, like a passive substrate. And the orange, or <coughs> excuse me, orange or red curve here is transmission through a thin film of silicon dioxide or fused silica on that substrate. It's like, I think it's like 1.8 micrometers of fused silica. So it's not very thick. And you can see there's a difference. The, the, the waveforms looks a bit different. And then those of you from the field will know that now we do the spectroscopy, we Fourier transform the traces, get the amplitude and phase of the ratio, and then we work up the spectroscopy. So th this is the spectral contents. We go up to 25 terahertz or something like, like that, amplitude and phase of the signals. And then in the end, we end up with, ca with extracting the frequency dependent complex permittivity of the silicon dioxide because we compare you know, air to silica gla uh, glass here. <coughs> Excuse me. And we find that, okay, this is not surprising because this is a pretty well studied material that we have a, you know, like a phonon or vibrational mode here at 14 terahertz or something like that, 13. Um, and then some smaller shoulders here that I would like to point out because I, I will make a point out, uh, out of them on the next slide, basically. So the technique works for spectroscopy and it's cool for those of you who are not in the terrace field every day. It's cool that we, without doing any tricks or something, you know, mathematical tricks on the data, we can actually get both the real and imaginary part of the dielectric function out here. Cool. What is that good for? It's good for, ah, yeah. One thing we can use this for is that if you recall, uh, let me, sorry, let me just flip back and remind you, sorry, here. The detected signal, if we look at it again, the detected signal we measure is proportional to the terrace field, of course, right? But the proportionality factor is the third order nonlinearity of the medium that mixes. So the chi three squared in this case here. So our signal is proportional to the nonlinearity of the medium. And we work with air, and air has a very low nonlinearity, so we need a lot of laser power and stuff to make it work, but that's fine. We know what the chi-3 of uh, different gases are. But we could also use this as a method to measure the chi-3 of solid state materials, because we just need a material with a chi-3, then this works, right? So what we did here, this is not, again, not us who found out about it. There's some very nice original work here from, uh, 
from Tomasino and the group he worked in over in Canada, uh, where they made a solid state bias coherent detection scheme, which is basically the same that I talked about, but they just replaced air, which has a, a chi 3 of 10 to minus a lot, 10 to minus, I forgot what the number is, now that's, that's, that's why I'm idling here, 10 to minus 27 or so um, meters squared per volt squared. They replaced that with, uh, with a material with a much, much, much higher chi 3, and that's of course a solid state material compared to a gas, it's much more dense, so it has a higher chi 3 also. So they took silicon dioxide, made a very nice detector out of that, it works fine, but uh, we wanted to see could we a, could we push the bandwidth, and B, could we actually use that technique to determine what is the chi 3 of a material? So we built a device that does this. I don't want to go too much into detail, but it's basically, you can see here, there's a little chip that consists of a silicon dioxide thin film here with some electrodes for the bias. It's not so important how that really works. But if we detect a terahertz pulse in air first, where we know what chi 3 is, then we sort of take out the air and put in the silica, that we have here, measure the exact same terahertz field and know how much optical power we use for probing and how big the spots are and all that stuff, then we can actually extract the chi 3 of the silicon dioxide, which is what you see in this plot here. This is the chi 3 in real units here as function of frequency, and you can see that actually varies quite a lot across the spectrum. Right? We have a big fat peak here at 13, 15 terahertz or so, there's another peak at 24, there's one at 30 here, and there seems to be something out at 40. We would really like to measure this one more time because it's sort of at the end of what we can do. But, but you can see that it's very frequency dependent. And then those of you who have studied nonlinear optics and Robert Boyd's book, for instance, will know that there's something called Miller's rule that says that the higher the, the linear optical property, or the, the linear permittivity of a medium is, the higher the nonlinearity will be. So that's, then this makes sense. We saw just a couple of slides ago, uh, one slide ago, that the refractive index or the, the permittivity has the same shape, right? There's a bump here at 13, 14, 15 terahertz. There's something at 24 terahertz, and it seems like it's growing up here. Here we couldn't do more spectroscopy from, for noise reasons, but you can see the same effect here, ding, ding, and ding here, right? So that works. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, we haven't published this yet. We tried to publish it, but got rejected, so I'm pretty really upset about that. Uh, but I'm not too, too fine to acknowledge that we were kicked out. Uh, but we're trying again. All right, now, that was sort of the technique we use. Uh, now I would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some general themes that we have been working on in my group. And one of them is, uh, and this is in collaboration with my very good colleague, Peter Bergil here, we have tried a lot to understand how can we make use of terahertz spectroscopy in, the, in connection with detecting the properties of uh, graphene. Graphene, 2D material, wonderful properties, hardest material in the universe and best conductor in the universe and best everything in the, the universe. Uh, but we also know that as soon as it's grown and transferred over to something, then it's not the best material in the universe anymore. Like it has defects, it has cracks, it has whatever. And if you want to grow large areas, you have to go to some CVD technique that makes like, what should I say, polycrystalline surfaces where the properties are more determined by how clean it is than by the graphene itself, right? So we thought it was interesting to see if we could help the, or tell the graphene community that, hey, we have a technique here that is quite nice for characterizing how nice the graphene is. Graphene, this is the, uh, this is the optical conductivity of graphene. You know that we can have intraband transitions where the carriers are sitting at the Fermi level here and an external low frequency field will sort of, you know, tickle the carriers a bit here, modulate them slightly around the Fermi level and then we can have, with larger photon energy, we can have interband transitions, you know, from valence to conduction band transitions. So it's two different mechanisms. And this mechanism over here, this is what gives rise to this universal conductivity that is uh, universal in the sense that it fills up like 20% of the whole spectrum here, right? Uh, that's of course the way, the way it's plotted. But, but still, uh, this is what gives rise to, because the band structure is as simple as it is, then the transition probability is independent of uh, frequency, basically. So we get this flat optical conductivity across the spectrum. 
Uh, but at low frequencies, there the intraband transitions take over, and we see this contribution to the optical conductivity coming from the free carriers only. That that's the true conductivity. This is like in a metal, we would we would have like interband transitions in normal metals up here, and then we would have true contribution at low frequencies. So th so that's actually not so much surprising in that. But we you can see that this true like bump here, this is for a Fermi level of 200 millivolts falls in the terahertz range, right? So we have terahertz spectroscopy, so I mean this is meant to be, right? Um, so the cool thing about graphene is also, as some of you undoubtedly know, is that we can actually tune the Fermi level. That means we can tune how conductive is the graphene. We cannot do that in a normal metal. The Fermi level is as the Fermi level is, right? But here we can, for instance, with a back gate or something like that, we can actually tune, tune the carrier concentration because we can charge the graphene sheet, so we tune the carrier concentration and that means we can tune the Fermi level also, which is pretty nice. All right, how do we do this? Spectroscopy, we have a sample here with graphene on and a substrate around, so we send a terrace pulse through the graphene, we might get some multiple reflections in here and stuff. We send another, the, the reference beam, through a part of the sample that doesn't have graphene on it, and then we compare, see what that looks like. Then we get the time traces again, like I've shown you with the other uh, case, where we can, you know, look at the direct transmission is the first, and then we see these different echoes from multiple passes in the substrate. And the reason why I show you this is just uh, ju just another like like small small tip here. If you <coughs> excuse me, if you have a system like graphene, it's not always super strongly absorbing for the terahertz radiation. You can see the contrast is not super high here between the red and the black trace here. Uh, but if you go to the e next echo, you can see the contrast actually gets better. And this is because the, over here, the terrace beam has gone through the graphene once, ding, and then it bounces and reflects ping, one more time. So it has touched the graphene two times. So that's twice the, twice the effect of the conductivity. So depending on what the sample properties are, this is sometimes nice doing that. Um, cool. And then we, from this data, we get the, you know, we fully transform the time traces and get the spectra, like I showed you with the silicon dioxide. And then we, from a theoretical point of view, we try to estimate what should the transmission, for instance, be. This is something called the, the Tinkham equation uh, that basically relates a uh, sheet conductivity and the substrate index to the measured transmission there. That's cool. So we can, from this, this is what we measure. So from this, we can invert this and then find what is the sheet con conductivity of the graphene. Looks like this. Great. This is as function of f frequency. We have the real part of the conductivity and the imaginary part of the conductivity. And the next step is then to say, OK, this looks like a Druder model in the sense that you know that's what the spectrum looks like. If it looked like something else, we would have fitted it with something else. But here it does. So the Druda model basically has a DC conductivity and a scattering time as its three par parameters. And it fits pretty well, in this case here at least. That's nice. So from the fit, we know what is sigma DC and what is tau. And then we rely, something else should pop up here. Ah, yeah. Then we rely on what people in the green world has learned since uh, 2006, 7 or so, and uh, that we can describe transport in graphene by the diffusive Boltzmann model, basically, that relates the, uh, the, the DC conductivity scattering time with the other parameters that are important, carrier concentration, carrier mobility. So once we know the scattering time and the DC conductivity, we can extract these other parameters here. Wonderful. So we can make maps like, like this. If we raster scan the terrace beam over the graphene surface, then we can actually collect st statistics here, right? Um, that's good. What can we use that for? I mean, this is nice and stuff, but who cares? People who make graphene care, uh, I would say. Uh, this is an example. We worked together with uh, Grafinia in Spain. Spain where we got a series of different graphene wafers from them. So that's graphene grown by, uh, by CVD on a copper foil and then transferred to a silicon wafer afterwards. And then we got these silicon wafers up in our lab and could measure, depending on how they have grown it, this is, at, this is, th this is the CVD growth temperature you see up here. So depending on what temperature the furnace had, 
we see more or less you know, high quality or high conductive graphene. The color scale here is the conductance. So you can see it looks like at 1000 to 1025 degrees, we have a sweet spot where the conductivity is high, the coverage is quite high, but at temperatures not too far away, actually the properties change quite a lot. So, so we thought that was qu quite, quite uh, nice and useful. Uh, our sort of slogan is that you don't get quality without quality control. And this is something the graphene world is looking at. Like, first of all, people should start to pub publish papers where they say what they do. And second of all, they need to have some kind of, you know, statistical quality control also, and not just pick the best sample they ever made, right? <laughs> okay, side, side track. Next step is to, uh, oh, what I just showed you here was basically, we can measure the conductivity of graphene on the macroscopic scale with our free space terrace beam. The resolution is, let's say 0.5 millimeters or something, 0.3 millimeters maybe if we really push hard. But graphene is not always you know, coming out in square meters. So we need something else if we want to go small. You probably all know this picture here. This is uh, from the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena, where Ernst Abbe uh, made his way around, I guess. And there's this beautiful stone here that has uh, its inscription on it. That is, of course, what we all know Ernst Abbe is famous for, the diffraction criterion here that we cannot focus light better, to better than to a spot size of approximately a wavelength. This is a problem in the terahertz range. One terahertz is 0.3 millimeters. So that's like the re worse than the resolution of our eyes. So that's a poor microscope. I would say it's, it's a macroscope, <laughs> right? So we need to do something else there. And what people do, some of you will know this already, is to go to the near field, of course. And we are interested in, because you can see that we have done a lot of work on graphene, so we're interested in graphene. But we also know that the CVD graphene that we have worked on quite a lot is basically the worst kind of graphene there is. If we do the old-fashioned scotch tape exfoliation of graphene, the quality is much better. Then we can encapsulate it in HBN, so we get like, you know, explosion of uh, uh, properties, right? So we would really like to be able to characterize small pieces of graphene also. So st something that looks like those here. You can see the scale bars here, this is 10 microns, uh, 10, 10 microns, this is a little bit larger, 25 microns, but it's all, you know, smaller than a terahertz spot size. And we would really like to see these are high, high contrast optical microscope images where we can actually count the number of layers of graphene. So sometimes the exfoliated sheet is a monolayer, sometimes it's three layers, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's 25, we don't know really. Well, the guys who do it, or girls who do it, practice and get better and so they know more and more but the first period they get just you know dust out of it right so it would be great if we could take our terrorist spectroscopy and be able to somehow you know see the things that we see here with the optical microscope but convert it into a conductivity scale is the conductivity of three layer graphene three times that of one layer nobody knows i mean there are theories for it but that's always a theory of uh, gra graphene perfectly flat in vacuum which never really works that, that, that way. So it's not, it's not given what the properties should be of this graphene here. And we were a little bit worried about it because there's a quite well-known paper uh, from super, super good people here uh, who showed, uh, it's, it's a couple of years old, or actually five years old by now, where they showed that in the terahertz range, if you go to the near field, it's very, very difficult to see any kind of material properties on graphene. Graphene is basically a perfect reflector in the near field, in the terrace range. So no matter w whether you have poor graphene or super good graphene, the reflectivity is one. So we cannot really distinguish whether you have a conductivity of one millisiemens or three millisiemens. And that makes it pretty bad technique, right? I mean, if, if you cannot distinguish between a mirror and a piece of glass, then, then your technique should be updated. Uh, so, so what they showed here was basically pictures like these. This is multi-layer graphene where they have, you know, zero layers of graphene, I think it is. Yeah, it must be one, two, three, four, five, six layers of graphene. This is an AFM image. And over here, there's a terahertz image recorded in the near field in the same frequency range that I just showed you images from. And it, you can see that it's, it's, it's all just reflecting very, very nicely. There's no contrast. And they argue from a theoretical point of view that this is the case. It should work. I mean, it, the experiment, state-of-the-art theory, agrees. So graphene and near-field and terahertz is a bad idea. 
But the problem was we read this paper after we bought the instrument. <laughs> so we had, like we had to do something anyway. So we tried it anyway. Uh, and the instrument we bought was a near field uh, scanning near field optical microscope or snub mic microscope. There's a German company called Nearspec or now it's called Atocube who makes these. They have the absolute world domination on this market here. But they make very nice uh, scattering type snub systems where they have like an AFM tip. They scatter a terahertz wave on the tip, th detect the scattered signal, and then it turns out that the amplitude and phase of the scattered signal depends on the complex surface conductivity or surface permittivity here. So, so you have a very nice way of making a local probe of the dielectric properties. Here you see like a far field picture. You see uh, one of these dipoles illuminated with a plane wave. And this is just a scattered part of the signal. You can see it radiates like a dipole. Of course it does. Uh, and here you see a little bit more in the near field what happens. This is the same simulation as the previous, but just zoomed in, where you can see that right under the tip we see a very strong field enhancement. And this is why we see a scattered signal that depends very much on the local properties right under that tip here. Cool? Um, let me just skip this because it's a little bit too detailed. The interesting thing is, it works. Right, these are again these uh, light microscope images, uh, high contrast, so you can just see the number of layers based on white light interference. And these are the terrace images recorded with the, uh, with the s system. And this is a monolayer, you can see that there's one L means one layer, as you can imagine, and one layer, two layers, and one, two, three layers here, and some combination over here. And we can clearly see whether we have one layer or two layers here, right? We can see here one layer, two layers, three layers, one, two, three layers. And even if we have monolayer, you can see like there's like erosion-like features in here that sort of shows that even within the monolayer, there's a clear variation of the contrast. So what goes on here? Like Menkum Liu's very good group, and uh, I mean, he's really a good guy and a, you know, a nice uh, person and everything is great. Why don't they see contrast when we, you know, Amateurs, we just bought the instrument and put in some graphene, right? And the PC student Henrik <laughs> like there has, had been working on the system for four months or something. I, I mean, it's not like it, it's his life work or anything, but it just worked. And the reason is simply, if you look at here, we have a certain signal to noise ratio. It looks nice and smooth, right? And if we go back to five years ago, the signal to, to noise was a lot worse. And I would claim but I haven't discussed this, this with Meng Kunglet uh, uh, yet, I would claim that if they had a 10 times better signal to noise ratio, they would have seen the same contrast. So they were in the sort of, in the great situation where they saw something that was limited by the experiment and theory predicted that it was right. But that doesn't make the, that doesn't make either experiment or theory right, right? <laughs> so uh, I would say that, that this sort of indicates, because the theory that he used, I mean, we went through the whole thing because we were super confused. It's absolutely correct. We have something in the field called the point dipole model and the finite dipole model and so on, and it's all correct. It predicts no contrast. Uh, I showed a picture of it here. If we concentrate on this picture down here, then this is, uh, there's a lot of things I haven't told you about how this works, but this is basically the scattered signal that we detect in the terrace range as function of the surface conductivity of an infinitely thin conductive layer here. It doesn't matter if it's graphene or gold or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's, it just has a conductivity and is infinitely thin, right? And the models that we have in the, the literature, this PDM and FDM are the point and, di point and finite dipole models. They predict that the contrast is at much lower conductivities than we see in graphene. So you can see that the signal, as you increase the conductivity, the signal grows up here. So it's not like there's no contrast. The contrast is just at a much lower conductivity change than what we have in normal metals. Uh, and the same thing goes for you know the point and the finite dipole model actually behaves in the same way. They just have different signal amplitudes. And then we were naive enough not to have read up on the literature before we started. So we just set up a COMSOL simulation. You know, we have a tip here, we have a wave in, we have a conductive sheet, solve, solve, solve. And that predicts the green curve here. 
and the green curve here, uh, um, the, the sort of, sorry, the gray part that I have indicated are typical graphene surface conductivities. 0.1 to 3 millisiemens, that's what we always observe. And you can see in that range, there's a linear dependence here on the signal strength. That's of course cheating because this is a log scale. So it's not really linear, it's, it's like a logarithmic connection, but still there's contrast, right? So somehow the existing models that are based on electromagnetism predicts that there's no contrast, but COMSOL, which is based on electromagnetism, predicts there's contrast. So there's just something missing in the models, that's it. Right. There's something that hasn't been taken into account because the models have been developed to determine the dielectric constant of dielectrics. So there's something that has not been taken into account is my best guess right now. We haven't solved the problem yet, but uh, cool. This is uh, just, just a console simulation in a little bit more detail. I think the point I want to make is that here you see this is a, in the computer a, a model or a layer that is supposed to mimic w one layer surrounded by two layers, surrounded by three layers. Because I had an image up here that looked like that, and, and we have a line scan going across, you know, three layers, two layers, one layer, two layer, three layer here. So we have something to compare with. So if we do the COMSOL simulation, that's what you see here. This is as a function of frequency of the terahertz wave and as a function of position across like one of these test samples in the computer that has, you know, uh, what is it? To 15 microns of one layer and 5 microns of two layer and 10 microns of three layers here. And then we just, in the computer simulation, we just tap the tip as we do in the experiment and then move over the surface and record everything that we should, should re record there. How that is done is a long story. We can talk about it afterwards if any of you cares. And we see here a contrast in the signal. The color scale is the scattering signal that we measure. <coughs> and going from mono to bi to tri-layer graphene, we see a contrast of, you know, based on the one-layer system, one, and then 1.05 and 1.17. And if you look at the corresponding experimental data, that's the green curve up here. Don't ask, well, you can ask why, but I don't, I'm not going to tell you right now at least. We get one, 1.04 and 1.14 that we should compare with this, this and this number here. So it sort of, it sort of agrees. Part of that agreement is random because it's not exactly the same system we simulate. We don't know what the Fermi levels are of the experimental sample. So in that sense, it's a little bit random that it matches. But at least we get something out, I mean contrast, in the same ballpark as what we see. So we're convinced that we're not seeing any exotic effects of you know, non-local response of the metal or whatever, something like that. It's simply electromagnetism that just needs to be formulated right if we want to have like an equation that solves it. Whew. All right. Last thing, last topic, uh, last five minutes, if that's okay, um, is about what happens when we turn up the field strength of the terahertz waves. Um, and this is a story that started many years ago. Uh, I was here a couple of years ago giving a talk where I think I sh showed some of the same slides here, but I've made some new stuff in the, the meantime. So, um, or, uh, But the story started by a long time ago. We uh, wanted to uh, figure out could we make resonant circuits with metallic structures on dielectric surfaces? So put a metal structure on a silicon surface. This is of course related to metamaterial research and things like, like that. And the simplest structure we could make up with or come up with well, was a simple linear dipole here. It has a certain length, so it has a resonance frequency. And uh, you can see that it's uh, 150 microns long or something like that, five microns wide, so it's very easy making. This is, you know, kindergarten clean room work. Um, this is if we make a computer simulation of what is the field distribution on this structure here. So we excite this structure with a plane wave at the resonance frequency 0.5 terahertz from the top, and then we sample what is the electric field in the plane here, right? And we can see that near the electrodes, we see this very strong field enhancement. We, excuse me, we have an incident field strength of one. So anything above one on this drawing here means that the field is stronger than in free space. So near the electrodes here, we have a field enhancement of more than 200 at least. So if we come in with, let's say, Samira's uh, 29 kilovolts per centimeter field strength, then we would have 29 kilovolts per centimeter times 200 field strength there, right? That's quite a lot. Um, and what was interesting was that when we looked at this, then for some reason the 
postdoc here, uh, Christoph Ivachuk, he was an extremely clever guy. He figured out, why not look at this with a UV spectrometer? I mean, don't ask me why he thought about that, but he did. <laughs> and, and he saw this, there's UV light coming out from the tips. Hmm. So we illuminate with 0.5 terahertz radiation on a met metal structure made in the kindergarten clean room. At, uh, and then we see light emission at 340 nanometers, which is like, what is this, uh, 800 terahertz or so. So that's really a multi-photon process, right? Of course it's not. Um, but what goes on there, and what goes on is that we actually, somehow we create a nitrogen plasma at the electrodes, or at the tips there. This is the, if we spectrally resolve or measure the spectrum of that UV light, we see a very rich spectrum coming out. And then, of course, uh, Christoph looked up the, uh, the literature, what, is the, what are the emission lines of a nitrogen plasma, and that's all the indications you see here, or the vibrational states that are involved. You see that it matches pretty well. It matches one on one here, right? So what, what this analysis shows is that we have here an emission system that is around 50% ionized nitrogen and 50% excited nitrogen, um, and that's what it is. So what happens is uh, that we have uh, lightweight driven tunneling basically or field driven tunneling. Uh, you, you know that electrons in a metal are bound by the work function so you need to apply uh, or supply at least that energy in order to lift an electron out into a vacuum. This is uh, photocathode stuff, right? Uh, but we also know that if we have a static electric field then we can bend the barrier, the, the vacuum potential, we can bend it down so that there's a uh, there's a tunneling channel opening up here. This is field emission. This is what is used in uh, many devices uh, together with, uh, uh, yeah, this is field emission. All right, this field emission is described by the Faro Norheim quantum tunneling theory in its simplest form at least, where we have this very, very non-linear relation between the field and the tunnel current. You can see up here if we increase the blue curve is that that function here so if we increase the field strength by a factor of 10 we increase the emission current by a factor of 10 to 30 so that's nonlinear right and that's also how we could make these conversions that 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 that, that you saw from terahertz to, to uv that we have something that is going crazy here this is not just chi 2 right or chi 3 this is chi 800 or so well anyway um what happens in the experiment is that we lift out or tunnel out electrons and then the electrons is born or are born in an electric field that will accelerate them. So the light emission that we see is basically that we have nitrogen, neutral nitrogen surrounding the electrodes and then plus these electrons that have at least 12 electron volt energy then we get excited nitrogen that relaxes and sends out UV light. And if we are above 15 electron volts then we ionize nitrogen that relax and emits UV light. So, so that what was going on there. So this is basically atmospheric chemistry, right? If we had placed another gas there, we would have seen other emission lines and we would have seen other chemical reactions. Well, I'm not sure if we could call it chemical reactions. Uh, that we can stack up into an array. These uh, single emission structures, we could stack them up in an array, like you see up here. Now we have modified the structure a little bit so that there's, there's less crosstalk between the individual elements. If you, you, you can imagine if we have a dipole next to a dipole, then there would be quite a, cr quite a crosstalk between them. But if we encapsulate the field enhancement, like you can see here in the diagrams shown here, then we have less crosstalk and then we get more light, like an impression of what is the local field. So if we stack that up in an array, then we see, hey, we can actually, now we can see the terror spot size, right? That's cool. So it's a camera. Um, what is this over here? It doesn't matter what that is, but basically, if we set up this effect in an array, then suddenly if we look at the emission of the UV light with a camera, then we have a terahertz sensitive camera. Then we replaced the nitrogen atmosphere with argon because argon emits in the red so that, that, that we could use a standard CMOS camera and everything was, was quite nice. That's cool. Um, that's cheap to build, it detects the electric field. Uh, detection bandwidth and center frequency can be designed if we make these structures half as big as they are here then they will respond to twice the frequency right so th so that's uh, kind of you kind of useful and here is uh, let me go to, th to the next next picture here is if we 
ah, well, how much should I spend, spend on this? Basically, the point I should make here is that uh, what, what you see on top here is that we have one of these uh, terahertz cameras, uh, microbarometer based cameras that senses the, uh, the terahertz intensity. And if we move that across the beam focus, then we can make like a profile of what is the divergence of the terahertz beam and stuff like that. And this is what you see up in the top diagram here. You can see the signal gets weaker, but, but that's because the spot gets bigger, right? But the, the, the camera actually sees more, more or less the same integrated signal here and here. But the nonlinear camera sees only a signal um, right in the focal region. Outside of the focal region, it's, it, it, the, there's basically no uh, signal. And this is because of, because of this very, very nonlinear relation between the field strength and the, t and the tunnel current. And the tunnel current depends on, or t tells us how many electrons are coming out and how many electrons are, are therefore available to co collide with, with molecules or atoms that can emit light, right? So there's a, there's a n very, very nonlinear relation between the field strength of the terahertz light and the signal coming out of this uh, camera here. And one can quantify that a little bit here with the, you see this is the set position along the scan here. If we integrate over all the pixels of the camera, then for the, for the normal terrace camera, we get this blue, sorry, black curve here. It rounds off a little bit because the beam gets larger than the camera array. So we don't count the whole beam anymore. And that, that's why it ro dro drops off a bit here. But the nonlinear camera basically looks like this here. There's a nice Gaussian uh, fit, but that doesn't really matter. The important thing is that we only see signal where the terahertz field is strong. We don't care about the average intensity or the heat or the power or something li like that. We actually have a camera that gets a bigger signal out if the peak intensity is high, which is pretty nice. All right. Last thing, photomultiplier tubes. What are they? You know what a photomultiplier tube is. It's a super sensitive device that can measure uh, single photons of light, right? And it works by the photoelectric effect. We have a photocathode here uh, where that you illuminate with photons above the work function. And that means you liberate an electron with one photon. And then that electron gets multiplied in a dynode structure here. And then you get a current impulse out that you can measure. So you can see a single photon if everything is dark. Uh, cool. Um, why why am, am I suddenly showing you a terahertz, or sorry, a PMT here? I'm showing you a PMT to remind you about how the PMT works. We shine light onto the cathode and liberate an electron by the photoelectric effect. And what I just showed you wh that was that we have a surface, we shine terahertz light on, we liberate electrons. Ah, right? So um, think about that while I explain why the PMT doesn't really work at long wavelength. That's because of the photo photoelectric effect. We need to overcome the work function of the metal or the metal plus whatever cesium coating they put on. So the longest wavelength we can buy, if you want to, is the, uh, what is this? I forgot what it is. A gal it's some kind of a gallium or, in no, s ah, th there is indium phosphide and indium gallium arsenide, some kind of mixture of that, that where they can really push the efficiency curve out to 1700 nanometers. But you can see there the quantum efficiency is like 1% or so, or 0.1% here. So. Long wavelength and PMTs, bad mix, right? It w they, they work exceedingly well here up in the, you know, UV range, for, for instance. So, of course, we thought about that because now we have surfaces that can emit electrons when, we, when you shine long wavelength light on them. So, what we did was that we contacted <laughs> Amamatsu and they thought, hey, that sounds pretty cool. Um, so, we set up a collaboration with them and we produced some of these surfaces and shipped them over to Hamamatsu where they integrated them in their standard, you know, big PMTs so they were easy to work with and there's a result of that shown here. Cannot really see that it's a modified one, but you have to trust me, it is. So this, the surface structure of, of this photocathode, you can, we, can, we can still call, call, call it that, is again these metamaterials structures with a strong field enhancement at, at the e emission region there. And yeah, this is the Hamamatsu team, great, right? Um, and what we, our sort of business plan with them or, or you know, business proposal with them was that, okay, to today, it de depends on how you plot this spectrum here, right? But today we have sensitivity of PMTs in this range here from the near infrared to the UV. But with our fantastic invention, 
we can expand the bandwidth quite a lot, right? Going all the, the, the way out here, we could probably go even further if needed, but then you can measure stuff by other means. So that they like that. Um, and what you see here is the output of one of these PMTs when illuminated with a single pulse of its terahertz source. You, you see we get a beautiful sharp uh, PMT pulse out of this. So, so this is just one shot, it's not average over, let me hope. Maybe are there Japanese in the room? Maybe somebody can <laughs> translate if it says averaging somewhere. But to my best knowledge, this is this is not an average signal. It's just, just a one or one shot thing. So it works really, really nicely. Um, and the scalability that I talked about before, if we s scale the dimensions of the structure, then we can scale the resonance frequency. This is what I've tried to indicate here. Here we have scaled them to the mid IR. This is a 40 terahertz design. This is a console simulation of the field enhancement at 10.1 micrometers. Uh, so we can see that, okay, of course we can scale the structures to shorter wavelength. And what you see on this scale here, this is tuning our OPA source. This is not a, in that sense, a terahertz source anymore, but it's a long wavelength OPA based uh, uh, laser source from two and a half to 10 and a half microns or so. Uh, then you can see that, okay, the blue curve here is the sensitivity or responsitivity, responsivity is called, of the 40 terahertz PMT. And you can see that, okay, the you can see up on the scale here, 40 terahertz is here. So it sort of matches. There's a band here where there's response. But then there's also like an overtone band here where it actually works better that we didn't understand why it was. And it also seems like a longer wavelength here. It actually also works pretty well. But we can really... Set, set up this device so that it works across the whole spectrum from from the terahertz range up to, to the to the infrared. Uh, if we build uh, the blue curve is enough here. This curve here is sort of older data where, where we took a 0.5 terahertz design, so the one I already showed you, so something that is not resonant, and then we tried to show that it still works and it does, but we need much much more optical power to make it work and. But my, I think my main message here is that actually it works across the whole, uh, you know, long w w wavelength uh, spectrum. Um, and we can use it for autocorrelations. We know that there's a non-linear non response of this uh, device. And the non-linear medium is what you need in a, in a standard autocorrelator. There you have some second harmonic generation crystal, typically a two-photon absorption diode or so, so that you can tell the difference uh, between whether a photon comes from one beam or the other beam and you know stuff like that that an autocorrelator can and if we use the, the this mid IR PMT as the non linear element then we can actually measure very nice I'm not sure if I should call it, well they are still autocorrelations but what we have learned in this study uh, and I'm not going to say more than what I'm saying in the next two sentences is that yes it works but it's very difficult to say how long the pulse is. <laughs> because the, the form of this, or, or the length, or you know, the duration and the shape of this autocorrelation trace here depends on the field strength. So if you double the electric field coming in, then the width of this here changes. Because it's a, well, uh, how should I formulate this in a short way? The Fowler-Norheim equation that I showed you as function of field is proportional to e squared times uh, e to the minus uh, constant over field, like that here, right? So, in the low field range, this is this is, this function is is what makes this curve go almost vertical. But in the high field range, this term dominates. So, in the high field range, this is actually turning into a standard second order process, and actually, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's why it depends. The, the 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 current as function of field depends. In, in its function, uh, as as function of the electric field depends very much on whether this term dominates or this term dominates, and that's something we try to you know quantify a bit here. Uh, this is something Malte Welsh is. He just sent in his PhD thesis last week. No, actually this week. Um, that that he worked on there. We are writing up a paper about it also. So. When does it work as an autocorrelator laser correlation? When does it not? Uh, stuff like that. All right. Whew. Last slide. Terra spectroscopy is good for contactless measurements, and in particular, I showed you about conductivity. We can get nanoscale resolution in spite of the long wavelength. 
because of the techniques that, that, that are available nowadays. And actually the, the res solution is, is like wavelength over 10,000 or so. So compared to other near field techniques, this is really, really, really near field. Uh, but that's because we start with a long wavelength, of course. So uh, we can drive electrons out of conductors by strong turret fields via this quantum tunneling. And the instantaneous electric field of such a turret wave or light wave, as we would sometimes call it if we want to attract f funding, controls the motion of the electrons. So this is different from, let's say, coherent control in the old days or something. Mm. Here we actually use the instantaneous electric field of a single pulse to, to, to determine whether we move an ele electron out of a metal, for instance, or not, and how the electron is accelerated afterwards. You should think about attosecond science here, where light wave electronics come from, that in attosecond science we have an atom sitting in its Coulomb potential here, and then there's a laser field coming by, and then the potential goes woo, 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 right? So if we only take the first woo, then the electrons can tunnel out, and then they get accelerated by the field until it goes woo. Then it pushes the then the field pushes the electrons back, front back, and it can scatter off the core, and relax, and therefore send out, uh, you know, deep UV light, basically. Cool. We're doing a little bit the same thing here, except for the weak collisions. That that we tunnel the electrons out, we accelerate them with the same field, and then uh, sometimes we actually see them crash back. But there's no, as far as we know at least, there's no, you know, atosecond at 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 pulses coming out of that, but who knows. <laughs> the UV light is sort of incoherent because the electrons come out, accelerate ballistically, but then hit something outside. So in that sense, <coughs> That, that light would also limit how efficient an attosecond generation would be because the electrons need to get back to the same point. And they never do because they bump into all sorts of crap outside. You know. And we know that attosecond generation works more efficiently if you go to longer wavelength. Uh, but I'm also sure that there's like a sweet spot where if you go to even longer wavelength it works worse again. Uh, and I've, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure where it is, but people have shown at least also out up to three or four microns or so, or five microns five or so, microns. goes up and then, yeah. So, yeah, and the last last uh, point here, here is that, that actually I wanted to show that actually if one of your students or postdocs get a good idea, that then even though it sounds like, okay, this is very long-haired, fundamental, weird terror stuff, then actually maybe it's useful, right? Maybe somebody can use it. So if you have something cool, then reach out to somebody who could could maybe use it. They have funded us with something like uh, like one million euros or so. We have taken out six or seven patents on it. Um, and there's a product on there, you know, upcoming products page now about it. So it has been quite nice. So I think that was my last slide, yes. Thank you very much.